Today we're going to look at aggregate demand. The word aggregate demand, or the term, simply means to collect or to gather. So in an economic sense, what it means is that we're gathering all the demand in an entire country. Well, let's kind of progress through this logically. In our study of microeconomics, what we studied was market demand. So what were the components of demand affecting the market for haircuts, or the market for oil, or the market for shoelaces? Well, market demand is composed of all the different individuals inside of the market. So, at a certain price, at a price of uh, $10, how many haircuts does Mr. McLaughlin want? At a price of $15, how many haircuts does Mr. McLaughlin want? So, it's taking all the individuals inside of a market and adding them together. Now, remember, there's lots of those. Um, and that becomes the market demand. And that's what microeconomics looks at. Market demand, then, when we start looking at all the markets inside of a country, so the market for uh, haircuts, the market for shoes, the market for oil, the market for, um, you know, uh, ditch diggers, all the markets of everything inside of a country, that's going to be aggregate demand. And that's what we study in macroeconomics. If we look at all the people, um, all the individuals who can demand things, so we have consumers and maybe they demand cars and movie tickets. Remember, investment is the term that we use for business spending on final goods and services. So if a business is buying a car, that's no different from me buying a car. The government, they have a use for cars, uh, so they might buy cars and stoplights. Foreign consumers might buy cars, okay? But they also might buy bratwurst. By the way, we must be in Germany here because I'm talking about Audi and bratwurst. And these are things that foreign consumers, so consumers outside of Germany, might buy from Germany. So let's look at all those just together for a second. We'll bring in the foreign suppliers last. Even though all four of these groups are competing for the same cars, Audis, even though that's true, it doesn't make it macroeconomics because we're talking about all four of these individuals competing with each other to buy the same car. Well, that's just part of a market. So that's just a microeconomic study. The only way foreign suppliers come in there, because obviously foreign suppliers aren't going to be buying Audis, Toyota isn't going to buy any Audis. Consumers and investors, uh, consumers and businesses, they might buy cars from a foreign supplier. Therefore, again, that's affecting the microeconomy of the market for Audis or the market for German cars. When we look at it from a macroeconomic perspective, then we have to look at all these things together and myriad other things. So everything that can be bought inside of a country is part of a country's aggregate demand. Now, when we write it as a formula, we write it as C plus I plus G plus X minus M. So again, consumption plus investment, government spending, exports minus imports. That's our formula for aggregate demand. And you'll remember that that's also the formula for GDP. But GDP does not equal aggregate demand. It can, but in most cases it won't. The reason for that, hopefully we'll, we'll stay on this topic and make it a little bit more clear throughout the coming weeks, but the reason for that is remember GDP is about the value of production inside of a year. So I could sell something that I produced last year and didn't sell. So that wouldn't be part of aggregate demand, so Audi could sell cars that were a year old. Um, or maybe even components of a car, if you don't believe that, maybe they can sell engines they made last year, um, you know, inside of brand new cars. So I could sell unused inventories, and that would be part of consumption or investment or government spending here for aggregate demand, but it wouldn't be part of GDP because it was produced in a previous year. On the other hand, desaving means when I'm spending money that I haven't earned, so if I'm borrowing money from a bank or from somebody else, or if I'm spending money that I previously saved, well, again, that would be part of aggregate demand, but remember GDP in a way is also equal to national income. So remember everybody here got paid, it was income. Well, if I didn't earn that money this year, then it's not part of this year's GDP. If I earned it last year or if somebody else earned it, um, I'm still spending it as part of aggregate demand, but it's not going to be part of GDP. 
So remember, we're trying to use you know, some, uh, some mathematical language here to describe something that is not nice and neat. The economy is very complex, so it doesn't matter that these two don't equal each other because it's not really what we're trying to get at. Also keep in mind, GDP is countable. Not that we could ever actually figure out what GDP is exactly, but it is a number, even if we don't know it. Aggregate demand is more of a concept or a theory, so it's not trying to apply that it is something exact. When we model aggregate demand, it looks very much like our model for just demand, with a few minor changes. Our x-axis, we're going to call it real GDP. Uh, you could also call it national output or national income. Uh, you could call it real national output, real national income. It doesn't really matter. What's important is that you choose something, you know, look at a book and make sure it's, you know, IB verified. But what matters is that we're trying to get a value, a numerical amount that represents the amount of production. And that's the other thing that's tricky about this, is that both of these are, are monetary values. The only reason that this is a monetary value, though, is because we're trying to assign a value to the amount of production that happens in a country. Remember, we can't put every product on the x-axis. We can't say 14 pairs of shoes and 36 Audis and 234 haircuts. We can't do that. It doesn't work that way. So we have to take all of those products and add them together, multiply them by their price, and we get a value of production in the country. We're still concerned about the actual production, the goods and services, but we can't represent it that way. We have to represent it as a value. The y-axis is the average price of all of those things. So what are things selling for on average inside of our country? Typically, we just call it price level. Some books will call it average price level. I think that's a bit redundant because the word average to me implies the same thing that the word level does, but it really doesn't matter. Both of those are accepted. As far as our coordinates, we need to call this PL1 or PL on the y-axis for price level. And we use the shorthand for Y for real GDP, really just to annoy the mathematicians out there because we're going to put Y on the X axis and that really just messes with them. No, just kidding. Y is our shorthand for national income. So what we're saying is that when price levels are high, the value of what we produce or the amount that we produce is low. But when things become cheaper, the amount of stuff we produce becomes more and more. Well, again, that's pretty easy to accept. When things cost less, we buy more. It's not dissimilar to the law of demand, but it's not exactly the same either. Here's why. When we explain why aggregate demand is negatively sloped, we really look at three components or three reasons for that. They are the wealth effect, the interest rate effect, and the international trade effect. Let's go through each of these just one by one. Don't confuse the word wealth with income. Income is the amount of money I earn from my work. Wealth is the value of things that I already own. So let's say that I buy a stock and I buy stocks that are worth $1,000. Okay. And I could have, instead of buying stocks for $1,000, I could have bought certain amount of other goods and services. Well, as the price level goes up, the amount of wealth I have becomes less and less. So let's say for $1,000 10 years ago, I could have bought maybe a decent used car. Probably not, but anyhow. As the prices go up and up and up, well, now for $1,000, I can't buy any kind of used car, maybe a used motorcycle. Therefore, because my stocks are still the same value, ceteris paribus, because my wealth is the same value, I feel like I'm less rich. Therefore, I pull back a little bit and I'm not going to buy as much as many other things. So because the price levels went up, I feel less wealthy and I get scared and I buy less things. That's the wealth effect. Of course, it works the other way as well. As price levels go down, I feel more and more wealthy and I buy more, and good, I buy more goods and services. Wealth effect, that mostly is going to affect consumption. It could affect some other things, but mostly we're going to see it on C. The interest rate effect is mostly going to affect investment. Let's see why. As price levels come down, 
consumers are going to uh, be able to buy most of the, th most of the things they want and they are therefore going to save larger amounts of their money. When they save their money, they save it in the bank, which means banks have more money to lend out, which means that the supply of money to be lent out is going to increase. Well, we know that whenever supply increases, the price falls. The price of borrowing money is the interest rate. Therefore, as price levels fall, people save more and interest rates fall, which means businesses who are the main people that borrow money, businesses are gonna borrow more and more money to expand, to buy better capital, things like that. So as the price levels fall, businesses will invest more. So again, that's mostly linked to investment. We will see some of that same effect with consumers. They might be more willing to, you know, swipe money onto, uh, swipe a purchase onto a credit card or something like that. The international trade effect, what we're going to see here is again, as price levels fall, goods inside of my service, uh, goods inside of my country are going to be relatively cheaper and I'm going to buy less imported goods. Also, people from other countries are going to see my price levels fall and they're going to be more attracted to buy the goods and services from my country. Therefore, as price levels fall, we'll see exports increase. Okay, so that's more production inside of the country. And we'll see imports decrease, which means people are switching over to buying domestic goods, which is more real GDP or more production inside of the country. So those are the three reasons for our downward slope of aggregate demand. Okay, finally, when we see a shift in aggregate demand, this is just like our micro idea. We're saying at the same price level, we're going to buy less stuff, Y3, or more stuff, Y2. Now keep in mind when you uh, draw this, we don't want to show this arrow kind of pointing up and to the right, because what we're trying to imply is at the same price level, I buy more things, which we see from Y1 to Y2. Therefore, my arrow ought to correlate to that. Same thing down here. When, price uh, when we see a shift of aggregate demand to the left, we're saying at the same price level, we buy less. Therefore, this arrow is more accurate. It's more, um, it goes along better with our theory. We'll talk about this more in depth in a, in a later video, but the reason that we're going to see a shift of aggregate demand either to the right or left is any change to the components of AD. So anytime we see C, I, G, X or M change, well then we're going to see a shift of aggregate demand. We'll go in more in depth, but just so you can have a basic understanding now, if interest rates fall, so the amount of money I have to pay to borrow money, if it falls, we're going to see both C and I increase. So at the same price, we're going to see greater aggregate demand and vice versa. G is basically about a political choice. So if a new government comes in and they decide that they're going to, um, you know, buy more things or hire more people, anyway, uh, some sort of political choice, we would see aggregate demand go left or right. This is often about exchange rates is an easy example here. If the value of my money in terms of other money changes, well, then I'm going to buy more or less exports and people are going to, I'm sorry, I'm going to buy more or less imports and foreign consumers are going to buy more or less of my exports. So in my three years in South Africa, uh, I've seen the exchange rate go from $1 to $1 to eight and a half Rand to now we're almost $1 to 12 Rand. So what that means is that $1 buys more and more stuff in South Africa than it used to. Therefore, you would see exports from South Africa hopefully going up because they're relatively cheaper.